Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 27th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But now we have a government that runs on fear. Homeland Security spends $90,000 on a threat chart to scare the public. Maybe we should fear the government. Then, Dennis Haster, longest serving Republican Speaker of the House, goes to the big house for 15 months. Not because he's a serial child molester. No, it's jail for withdrawing his own money from his own bank account. And... Bye, go home to mommy. Go home to mommy. Ted Cruz is now mathematically ineligible, needing 110% of the remaining delegates to win the election. Trump only needs 46%. Out, 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 out. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Have you ever taken a moment to think about your pension? If you're lucky enough to have one, you spend years pouring into something, hoping that you'll get your just desserts at the end, but it doesn't always work out that way. And now we have a story out of Detroit. Among many other issues that are going around in the city, we see Detroit Public Schools keeps money for pensions. Michigan is investigating why the Detroit Public Schools District received up to $30 million in U.S. Department of Education reimbursements for some employee pensions, but didn't send the money to the state pensions fund. Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, so you guys get $30 million and you just forget to put it where it's supposed to go. Uh, it reminds me of the story I saw a, a few years back, I believe it was in Arkansas. It's a story about a gentleman, I believe he had worked as a firefighter, and then he became a mall security guard because they wouldn't give him his retirement funds. And then the mayor was on TV saying, well, if we give uh, these firefighters and all these emergency workers, you know, policemen or whatever, their retirement funds, their pensions, we're not gonna be able to afford other city resources. I'm like, well, these guys worked, you know, 20, 30 years, they risked their lives. Some of them lost their lives. They need this money. Their families need their, this money to go on and continue to live. And they're saying, no, we're just not gonna give you your pensions, your retirements. And that's a very scary thing. You guys really need to put that into consideration, especially if you're toward the retirement age, or even if you're not, if you're like me and you got many more years to go, Think about where exactly your money is heading. Uh, that's why one reason I used to work for the county, not now, but many years ago, and they're asking me, hey, do you want to put in on this retirement fund or this pension fund? I said, no, I don't. I don't expect it to be there in 20, 30 years. So um, each is own. It's something I'd rather put money in the bank or into some other investment. But uh, if you guys think the pension is going to be there for you, then that's the risk that you take. Now, we started off talking about abusing the teachers and abusing the administrators. Now let's talk about abusing the students. We see that Dennis Hastert has admitted to sexually abusing teenage boys. And this is the former House Speaker Dennis Hastert on Wednesday admitted to sexually abusing teenage boys during his time as a high school wrestling coach in a Chicago suburb before his career as an elected official. He received 15 months, not years, he received 15 months in prison a $250,000 fine, along with two years of supervised release on the condition that he gets sex offender treatment, and the judge called Hastert a serial child molester. Now, um, I was talking about this story a little bit earlier, and the crew like, is you mean 15 years? I know that this is not a typo. This man is getting 15 months. Now, consider this. If some you know janitor at a pool or whatever was accused of doing some... Uh, unscrupulous activity with a little girl, they'd easily get a guy 10, 15 years, you know, like that sex offender, you know, rest of his life, you know, signing the law in the whole nine. But, you know, Dennis Hastert, an elected official gets caught and he gets, you know, a slap on the wrist, you know, 15 months. That's really nothing for that heinous of crime, especially to be labeled a serial child molester. And it's, uh, I don't want to say it's a boys club because there are many people in the government who don't like this type of activity. But you think about guys like Haster, guys like uh, Sandusky, uh, Jimmy Seville overseas. These guys get caught doing these horrible crimes and a lot of times are able to go on continuing with these crimes. Like I said, uh, with the case of Seville overseas, it was well known or documented that the guy was a sexual predator. It was a conspiracy theory at the time he was alive. But as soon as he died and they looked into his records, they found, you know, all the pictures and the sex dungeons and all this other stuff he had going on. Meanwhile, he was going around free and easy while he was alive. It's a very sad deal, and I really wish they'd give these guys 
tougher penalties because that's the biggest deal in the U.S. justice system. Like, we need more laws. Like, no, you don't need more laws. You need to enforce the laws that you have now. A guy like Haster, granted, he's not much of a threat now. You know, he's an old wheelchair-bound man, or at least that's what he is visually. I don't know how much of that is an act, but um, 15 months seems a little bit light in my personal opinion. So we're talking about assaulting the children on the school ground. What about assaulting the children when you go out to these political rallies? Now, one of the big deals he attacked Trump for, which I don't think is fair, there's many legitimate criticisms of the man that you can make, going from the wall to his views on torture, on and on and on. But when they talk about the violence that go on at these political rallies, he's not endorsing that type of violence. If you go to a uh, you know Hillary Clinton rally and you got your Hillary shirt on and you punch somebody in the face, I don't blame Mrs. Clinton for that type of activity, but they want to blame the Trump protesters anytime a scuffle happens or something along those lines. And now we have a self-righteous social justice warrior who has taken it upon himself to go out to the rallies and agitate the Trump demonstrators. Now, this is where the issue lies. When he goes out there to agitate and you know get involved in his confrontation, he's not being very conscious of where he decides to spray his pepper spray and ends up spraying two little girls. <laughs> Targeted with pepper spray, police say anti-Trump protesters sprayed five Trump supporters, including an 8 and 11 year old girl outside Anaheim City Hall before the meeting even started. The chaos continued when one Trump supporter appeared to pull out what looks like a taser. And on the note of Donald Trump, he had quite the night last night, but let's talk about one of his running opponents. And that is, as he has come to be known now, Lion Ted Cruz. And they say it's official. Ted Cruz is mathematically eliminated from the GOP race. Uh, Drudge had the headline, Eliminate Ted. <laughs> so they really were sticking it to Ted on this one. And you see the chart right there on your screen. They say that Donald Trump has 954 delegates so far. Uh, Ted Cruz has 560 delegates after winning one last night but he still needs an additional 677, but there are only 622 available, which is to say it is over for Ted. But he's still in his mind trying to convince you that he's in this thing. He just announced that Carly Free Arena is going to be a part of his campaign, which really wasn't a shock to me. They seem to be buddy-buddy for quite some time. But he still wants to be in the race. He's in it to win it, I guess, to speak, even though he mathematically cannot win this race. But We'll see what kind of tricks he pulls out to uh, keep this thing going. And as we're talking about these politicians, let's talk about one John McCain. I'm sure you guys remember John McCain. He's going overseas and he's hanging out with all these Al Qaeda rebels. And then he, and then uh, just let me go with this story real quick. If you guys don't recall this, a couple years ago, John McCain goes over to Syria and he's hanging out with these Syria rebels, most of whom aren't even Syrian and many of whom have sworn their allegiance to Al Qaeda. Put that in your head. Now, when these pictures are taken and they make it back to the American press, he says, oh, I didn't know who these guys were. I just thought they're, you know, random guys on the street were out taking selfies and have a good time. Now, if he would have left it right there, like, okay, maybe he didn't know who these guys were. But then you fast forward a couple years, uh, he's having these arguments and these debates with Rand Paul, and Rand Paul's calling him out on all this stuff. He's like, hey, I know who these Syrian rebels are. I had to go out there and I take pictures with them. I'm like, oh, hold on, I thought you didn't know who they were. This is the type of person John McCain is. Now, with all that said, I'm not faulting John McCain for this particular article, just as we were talking about earlier with the violence going on at these various rallies. I don't fault Trump or you know Hillary or Bernie or whoever else for, these, for this type of violence. But on that same note, I don't fault John McCain for this story. John McCain's fundraiser busted for a meth lab with LSD, coke, heroin, and counterfeit cash. According to the Arizona Republic, the sheriff's office identified Emily Pitha, age 34, she has worked most recently on a campaign for John McCain's 2016 re-election. McCain's campaign manager issued a statement after the reports, quickly throwing Mrs. Pitha under the nearest bus. We commend the hard work and dedication of our law enforcement officers in their fight to keep our community safe from illegal drugs and associated criminal activity. The campaign immediately terminated any relationship with Ms. Pitha upon learning of her alleged involvement in the operation. Once again, not John McCain's fault, but... Uh, shows you kind of things that are going on in politics. Everybody has this notion, or I don't say everybody, many people have this notion that people in politics are these good, conquering, moral authority people. They're just normal people. Uh, if you have a, a meth lab before you get into politics, you may still have it, 
on the back end in case things don't work out for you, as is the case with Miss Pitha. We'll see how this story develops. Now, something I thought was very encouraging when I looked at a news cycle earlier today, we see that 120 have been arrested in one of the largest gang busts in the history of New York City. And it says two rival street gangs, big money bosses, and two fly YGs. The gangs are accused of violently feuding with each other over trafficking, drugs, and weapons. Sources told CBS New York about 1,000 law enforcement officials took part in the massive sweep. Now I'm gonna pause right there. Once again, good job to law enforcement for getting this many people, but I couldn't help to notice that for 1,000 officers, you only got 120 gangsters. And I'm sure there are other people got caught up in this sweep as well, but that's, you know, what, 10 people to, to one guy? Uh, that's not exactly the, the greatest numbers, especially when you consider how they had helicopters and armored vehicles and all these other toys to track down these bad guys. Once again, I'm glad this 100, these 120 guys are out the street, but I don't think that's the most efficient use of uh, NYPD resources, but uh, to each his own, maybe they think it's a great idea. But I'm glad those bad boys are behind bars. Now let's talk about uh, the state of Missouri where they didn't have a big massive sweep, but I don't think we'll need to have a big massive sweep for the fact they just passed constitutional carry. Well, at least they passed it in some measure. It's going on to the state Senate a little bit later. And this is House Bill 1468, introduced by Representative Eric Burleson, passed by an overwhelming 112 to 37 vote, and will now head to the state Senate. Now, people say constitutional carry is, you know, it's dirty, it's illegal, it's, you know, you can have all these cowboys running around. If you look at states that have constitutional carry, not everybody's walking around with a pistol on their hip. It's a very uh, mythos type of deal. Like uh, when they were trying to pass open carry here in the state of Texas, and, you know, I'd go to these meetings at the Texas State Capitol, and you'd have, you know, the moms against enjoying life or whatever they're called. And they're saying, hey, if we pass open carry, we're going to have all these cowboys running around with the pistols on the hip, shooting up in the air. I'm like, no, I'm from Oklahoma, and I believe we passed open carry back in 2012, 13 or so. And whenever I go home to Oklahoma for holidays or whatever, I see, you know, one or two people open carrying. It's not a big deal. It may be more uh, plentiful, like in the rural areas, but if you go to the big cities, it's not something people do. It's not, you know, you're not going to see grandma walking around with the big shotgun on her hip or whatever. Um, so a similar thing with open carry, I don't think it's that big of a deal. If people want to openly carry or uh, constitutional carry for that matter, I say let them do it. It's no issue with me. You're not a criminal until you're convicted guilty of a crime. If you have no criminal record, I have no issue with it. But uh, not everybody's like me. Now let's talk about ISIS. And ISIS has been a growing problem for the last several years. They've been growing in strength. Uh, also doing support from governments. <laughs> Uh, notably, the United States government, as well as other ones, you know, air dropping grenades. We've shown you guys that footage countless times. And now we see ISIS has taken advantage of Europe's open borders to plant sleeper cells in the UK, Germany, and Italy, head of American intelligence warns. This is James Clapper. Now, let me stop right there. When we talk about James Clapper, he's the director of national intelligence here in the United States. If you guys do recall, this is the same guy who sat in front of a, uh, you know, committee and they asked him, Mr. Clapper, does the NSA collect any type of data on the American public at large? And he scratched his head and he's like, <clears throat> no, I, I don't believe so. Well, that was an outright lie. He knew it was a lie being the head of national intelligence. So I'm not saying I believe everything the guy says, but I can believe him on this one particular issue because it's very common sense. If you want to get into a country undetected and if you have uh, nefarious intent, wouldn't you want to go in this you know, mass crowd of migrants, you don't want to go through some, you know, visa process where you get checked at the airport and they're looking at your bags and all this other stuff. No, you just want to be, you know, cartelled or uh, corralled into one big group, go through, you know, have your you know, fingerprints taken or whatever they do. And if you don't have any fingerprints on record, hey, you're in the country and now you can do whatever you want. When asked whether ISIS had groups in the UK, Germany, or Italy, similar to those that carried out the Paris attacks in Brussels attacks, Clapper replied, yes, they do. He added that intelligence Officials continue to see evidence of plotting on the part of ISIS in these countries, the New York Times has reported. And as I said again, common sense. This is why you have a border. When I meet these people and they say the concept of a border is inherently racist, this is an actual conversation I have with a guy. We went out to Murrieta, California, if that's right. Me, Biggs, and some of the other crew. And I met this guy. He is a Native American man. And he was saying that the concept of owning land was something that rich white Europeans came up with. 
And my retort to him, I was like, bro, Indians had land wars all the time. All of their, their complete history books of Native Americans fighting over lands. So it's not something that rich white settlers brought here. It's just, you know, somewhat human nature for people to fight over territory. Nothing, you know, racial or religious or anything else. That's just something that people do. And But this is the notion that people have when you talk about borders. In a similar way, people talk about a border fence. They talk about building a fence on the U.S.-Mexico border would be a racist symbol. Once again, I'm not a fan of a physical wall, but when you take into account how there's a wall in South Mexico, it's hard for me to understand why people would say it's racist to put a wall on the U.S., Mexico border when there's one in South Mexico. That just makes absolutely no sense to me. And something that made absolutely no sense to many Americans, you guys remember the threat index that was $90,000 and it was rejected by the Institute for Defense Analysis. They said the chart was misleading, confusing, and overly simplistic, noting that it was a disaster. Now, this is in the age of big sis, uh, see something, say something. You guys see those reports we did back in the day. Alex Jones, the snitch society, he's walking around. Hey, man, this guy is buying coffee with cash and he has on blue jeans. Those were based on actual reports. I know it's a funny skit. You guys go watch it again. But that stuff actually happened. This is the see something, say something era, and I'm glad that we're through with it, hopefully. So stay tuned after this break. We have more special reports coming up right here on the InfoWars Nightly News. I had the founder of Oathkeeper, Stuart Rhodes, on a few weeks ago, and he said, you need to get Matt Bracken on. He really knows what he's talking about. You should go read his articles. And I did read them, and just they're amazing. In fact, I want to start reposting them on Infowars.com and, 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 of course, linking to his side if he'd be gracious enough for us to do that uh, because it's very, very important. Tet Take Two, Islam's 2016 European Offensive, and he's the uh, author of Enemies Foreign and Domestic and a well-known advocate for Second Amendment rights. Uh, the following... Um, Guest essay by Bracken is also being published at Western Rifle Shooters Association. And he's also written another article dealing with uh, burning down the house in 2016. He sees war in the near future before a new president takes office. We're going to look at that coming up as well. But uh, enemiesforeignanddomestic.com, enemiesforeignanddomestic.com, and I'm not going to go over his whole bio. You can go there and see it, but a long career in the Navy SEALs uh, going back into the 1980s, Beirut, you name it, just all over the world, uh, Panama Canal, it goes on and on, what he's seen. So he's actually been there, done that, um, witnessed how people infiltrate, both from the side of an infiltrator, someone trying to find the infiltrators, and he has really written some detailed breakdowns of what's happening. He's a self-described uh, freedom supporter, a constitutionalist who believes in uh, original intent of the Founding Fathers of our country. He lives with his family in North Florida. So Matt, thanks for coming on. Um, reading your essay, just studying history and, and what's happening, I can find no fault. And of course, you bring your military background to it as well. Uh, a lot of folks respect your writing. Uh, you, you've heard what I've said in the last five minutes. W was that overall accurate? And what can you add uh, in an overall overview for folks in the next five minutes before we go to break? Okay, it's, it's um, perfect. Your byline of your website and your show there is a war for our minds, a battle going on for our minds. It doesn't matter if we're like monks in an Irish monastery discussing what's actually happening if the war for the minds is being lost at the at the at the mass level. We make fun of the North Koreans. you know we we show them doing the wave in stadiums or you know swooning for dear leader. But look at Swedes. They've been brainwashed into actually hating themselves. But when they look at the mirror, they say, this blondness just has to go. We're so guilty of everything. Swedes. In America, I mean, the madness over transgender. I just saw a YouTube video um, on a college campus. The guy says, what if I want to be, if I, if I feel that I'm a six foot five Chinese woman? And everybody agrees, if that's what you feel, then we should respect you as a six foot five Chinese woman. So the, you can see how much work we have to do. I mean, the fact that after a century of communism, 100 million to 200 million killed under the social, various socialist banners, you have the young generation supporting this retread Bernie Sanders who honeymooned in Nicaragua and Soviet Union, um, Nicaragua during a revolutionary phase. I think this is an extremely dangerous time. I think that, it's, that 2016 is like a 1916 or 1787 or, or 1788. Another key turning, another key point in the pendulum. So, so a crossroads. 
a big crossroads. We're going to have the, the big Marxist breakout, especially, for example, if tr let's say Trump wins, there's no kinetic event like an assassination. All of these can happen. Massive riots like Watts, Ferguson, Baltimore constantly. Imagine Cleveland on fire during the convention with armored personnel carriers all the way around the beltway. We see Beyonce and, and MTV priming the pump. That's That's got to yes. be a directive from on top. Absolutely. That, that's the, the narrative. So this is the war for the mines. And, and the, in Germany, they actually have a new word. Uh, I think it's Lugenpresse, but it means liar press. So they refer to that, the mainstream media. And I would include almost everything that you can turn on your cable channel is more or less controlled media. They don't get out of certain boundaries. If, you know, if, if anything says uh, anywhere peripherally, that this could be a conspiracy theory, they absolutely won't touch it. Oh, there's total Which scripting. There's total scripting. conspiracies to come off. <laughs> exactly, total scripting. So please continue, Matt. Well, I think that the, the biggest danger, we're going to have riots in this country, but in Europe, we're going to have an outbreak of Beslan, uh, the, uh, the Paris attacks, Brussels attacks. Something very significant happened during the, the Brussels attacks. And you have to understand that a government, a mass, a, a big organization has to have a uh, communication structure. It's not like a one brain. It has, you know, many individuals. So you have to put a lot of credence in such things as the uh, security levels. They went from sec their maximum security level four back down to three within like 24 hours or 48 hours while terrorists were still on the loose because they were absolutely wiped out. Everybody worked the maximum of overtime. They're exhausted. They can't do it. They have to go home and sleep. Europe has no bench. I think the German army is like 50,000 troops, and they are unionized, and they won't work over 40 hours. And during NATO exercises, they just quit halfway because the union rep says, that's it, and we don't cross rivers after dark or whatever. So they have no bench. We're going to have an outbreak in Europe. It'll probably start with maybe a do uh, eight, 10, a dozen attacks widespread. The terrorists have learned the, the uh, utility of the synergistic effects of having attacks in various time, uh, places at the same time. It, we used to think of it as an al-Qaeda signature, like the East, Arab, East um, Africa embassies um, being exploded on the same day. But it's more than that. It's a way to overwhelm the, the security system. And in Europe, that's going to be a big problem. Uh, at the same time that we're going to see these Bezlan type attacks. We're going to see infrastructure attacks. Uh, and they'll probably do it on a holiday like they did the Tet Offensive, knowing most of the security services are taking a well-earned break. Yeah, and, and it's it's not going to be like the Tet, the Tet in Vietnam, folks that remember that, where that was an actual uh, instruction orders had been assigned. We, the CIA completely missed it, or they might as well have missed it. If any messages were coming in from the field, they were disregarded. But they infiltrated 80,000 uh, VC fighters into cities. And then all on the same day, they went and grabbed AK-47s and satchel charges from caches and ran amok. It won't be like that in Europe. I'm not saying there are 80,000 guys with an order and, you know, to go on uh, Bastille Day. It's not going to be like that. But when there are, say, 10 attacks, like a, one of Bezna, Bezlan or uh, Paris or Brussels level, that continues so that tomorrow there's another one and then there's somebody just you know running amok with a knife what do police departments do what does the military do because they're going to be caught in the middle of this especially when terrorists particularly in europe will see it first because the this islamic tet is going to happen in europe it's going to be a huge wake up for us it may lead to a landslide victory for trump imagine something worse than 9 9 11 uh in october how does Hillary explain that? You know, people come in from Benghazi and blow up Rome. Uh, you know, it's going to make Trump a sure victor if that happens. And then the, the left will say, this is our chance. We have to go for it. And there will be street riots like between the, uh, the communists and the national socialists in Berlin. I expect to see shooting at some of these big demonstrations or explosions going off. Um, and in that way, the powers that be can say, uh, we, we need to um, put in a little bit of emergency conditions. Therefore, the uh, protests will have to be in separate safe zones, 10 miles outside the Beltway at a designated FEMA camp or whatever they want to say. But we'll, we're going to see the um, freedom of assembly taken away. The, the, the key word, and that's almost like a code word, 
when you start hearing emergency, because they'll never say martial law. Those words will never come out of Obama, Jarrett, Michelle, that, that crowd. It'll be emergency. They'll say, during the present emergency, we can't afford uh, to have these mass demonstrations, which always lead to violence and, unfortunately, bombs going off and people shooting. So we have to put that in abeyance. Now, if there's a real takedown, the grid goes down uh, before November, then there'll be no election. If there's no electricity, there's no election. Then we're automatically into an emergency situation. Um, another way that the communists can engineer this is to start a rumor, doesn't have to have any boots on the ground, just start a rumor, an internet rumor, that you know white racist crackers are planning to snipe at black folks lined up at the polling stations. Just a rumor, it's all it takes. You can even you know put up a fake YouTube if you want. You know, Find something from 10 years ago somewhere else, recaption it as this happened yesterday, and it'll sound like you know rednecks are dragging blacks behind chains in Mississippi, and shooting and threatening to shoot at blacks in polling stations. If that suppresses the black turnout, or even if it doesn't, they'll just say that it did, then they'll say that the election would have swung on that vote, which was suppressed by white violence. This is a narrative that will be completely sold by the mainstream media. Well, the just like the, the, the burning black churches thing turned out to be totally right. fake, just like the lacrosse team was fake, that was they'll all beta testing, time. and they're just they'll launching this time. everywhere. Government officials in Bristol said that their city was too multicultural to celebrate St. George's Day, England's version of the 4th of July. Except that it's nothing like the 4th of July because for the last two decades the English have been endlessly lectured about how displaying their own flag is racist. Meaning that the only people who dare display it now are drunk soccer fans an actual racist. The council said that displaying the flag may be seen as racist towards non-English people. And to be fair, England is a very racist and intolerant country. So it's only right that we should be ashamed of our own heritage. I mean, we only import 300,000 net immigrants every single year and give them immediate access to free welfare, social housing, and all manner of other benefits. How fucking racist is that? We're so intolerant that we tolerate Islamic hate preachers calling for homosexuals and women to be stoned to death, while arresting Brits who criticize Muslim immigration on Twitter. We're so intolerant that while banning the English flag, we allow Islamists to walk around the houses of parliament draped in the ISIS flag, while arresting Brits who read out Winston Churchill quotes in public. We're so intolerant that we don't arrest Pakistani rape gangs while they're sex trafficking children to avoid being called politically incorrect, while flying Pakistani flags over town halls to celebrate their national day. We're so intolerant that we make taxpayers foot the bill for Al-Qaeda propagandists to live in one million pound mansions rent free, while arresting Brits who plan to attend Draw Mohammed events. This is by no means the first time that the English flag has been characterised as a racist symbol by our own government officials. Back in 2013, the local council in Radstock, Somerset refused to display the St George's Cross because it may have offended the town's 16 Muslim residents. During the 2010 World Cup, council employees in Bolton were banned from flying the flag quote, over fears they could be deemed racist. In 2009, Labour-run Sandwell Council withdrew funding for a St George's Day parade, citing fears that it might attract far-right elements. What makes this even more absurd is that they asked a Muslim community leader in Bristol if he was offended by the English flag. Listen to his response. To say that Muslims are offended, I don't think is correct. We understand the flag is part of this country's heritage, and in fact many, many Muslims will identify as being British themselves. Once again, it's white middle-class leftists getting offended on behalf of Muslims. This is the bigotry of low expectations. They think that Muslims are so irrational and weak-minded that they would wet the bed if they saw a red cross on a piece of white material. How demeaning is that? Ask yourself. Would bureaucrats in any other country in the world behave like this? To be afraid of displaying their own flag on their own national day? Imagine Bastille Day without the tree color. Imagine Cinco de Mayo without the Mexican flag. We're literally being told that our own flag 
under which millions of foreign immigrants have been given the opportunity to reside in our country is a symbol of racism. Our own local governments are censoring St. George, somebody who protected Christians against Muslim attacks in the 3rd century. While European governments import millions of Muslim migrants, some of whom see the refugee crisis as an opportunity to enact jihad by emigration. While political leaders in neighbouring countries openly celebrate the demographic suicide of their own population. Unsere Stadt wird sich radikal verändern. Ich bin der Auffassung, dass wir in 20, 30 Jahren gar keine ethnischen Mehrheiten mehr haben in unserer Stadt. Ich sage Ihnen noch ganz deutlich, gerade hier in Richtung rechts, das ist gut so. Is it really a surprise that right-wing political parties are sweeping to victory across the continent when our own governments brazenly denounce our own flag as a hate symbol while vowing to make us a minority in our own country. How would citizens of any other country in the world feel about that? Imagine if Brazilians were suddenly told that their flag was a hateful piece of shit and that they were going to be supplanted by Chinese people. Yet this happens in England, it happens in Germany. And we just sit back and accept it because we're so racist and intolerant. <laughs> We've all heard of driving while distracted, but what about walking while distracted? Well, one town in Germany takes this so seriously that they're actually putting traffic control devices on the ground. So we're here at the University of Texas to see if this is a worthy initiative. Hey, how are you doing today, miss? Hi, I'm we're, good. we're talking to people about texting and walking, so you are a prime <laughs> so candidate. Funny. Okay, so there's a town in Germany that's actually experimenting with putting traffic control devices on the ground so you wouldn't have to look up from your phone. Do you think something like that would be a good investment for the city of Austin? Like it would be green, red, and yellow on the floor, like things to like help you go. Yeah, like let's say if you're walking up to a stop sign or an intersection and you get to the to the edge and it says a big red a big red dot to yeah. tell you to stop. I don't know if the money, how much that would take versus just like looking up from your phone. Is it? It's probably going to cost a lot to like put things like that on the floor and like make that happen everywhere. I so. And I think it's better to like really see the nature and like not text while. I mean, we should not text while walking or driving just because there's so much better things to see. So honestly, I also walk while I text. It can be a good idea, but I also when I'm when I'm walking, I always look at the stoplight to see is it going to walk. It can be a good idea. I don't know if it's worth the money that might be investing. I don't know how much it costs for them. That's a real question, I think. Let's say you walk up to a stop sign. Instead of looking up from your phone to see there's a stop sign, there's like a big red dot on, on the ground, basically like a stop sign on the ground. Okay. So yeah, that, that's, that, works, that works really well, I guess. You think? Yeah. It honestly might be. I mean, maybe not just for the city, but definitely for the campus, because we're all college kids and we're all walking around staring at our phones. But um, I, yeah, I really can't tell you how many times I'm walking and I trip over my own feet or I almost walk into someone because I'm guilty of it too. Mostly the times, like, at least on campus-wise, like, you'll run into things that, you know, like, things that aren't at, like, a traffic mm -hmm. intersection. So, like, maybe it's, like, a pole or something or, like, a person. So I don't know how effective that would be unless if you're, like, talking about, like, you know, actually out by the road. So okay. A lot of people are walking here with their phones on their hand and, I don't know, I think it'd just be safer for them especially in that part where there's a video of a, even a student being run off by a bus. Oh, wow. I don't know if you saw that like no. a couple of years ago, but he was on a sword fight, not on his, on his phone. Yeah, they, there's, they have like a tradition where people stand on both sides of the street. So, but still I see every day people walking around there with their phones on their hands. So it might be a good idea. Hey, what about like an app? Like if you're walking on your phone and you get to a stop sign, you're, something would pop a slip say stop here at the stop sign? Oh, I don't know if that would work as efficiently <laughs> than like being aware of your surroundings. It's not the same as like uh, texting while driving, mm -hmm. but I think it'd be useful to start like a health promotion campaign too. Uh, uh, more of an awareness campaign. Very yes. Good. That's fair enough. And what about something like an app? A similar situation, you're approaching a stop sign and you have um, you know, like a stop sign that appears on your phone. Yeah, I think that'd be useful. I think it's more useful to incentivize people rather than punish. Possibly, yeah. I, f I feel like uh, that could that could be effective if you know it was 
you know, properly, you know, designed and implemented, it could be effective. If something popped up on your phone and it was like, stop. Nah, that's too much. That's too much. I mean, then you'd have to download the app and everyone doesn't have an app. It just wouldn't work. That, that's like, that doesn't make sense to me. I think that's kind of a lot to put on everyone's phone. And I don't know if that, like, can you require that of someone? Oh, uh, it's hypothetical. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess it would work um, and prevent people from tripping over their own feet like I do a lot, so. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> In its now almost 15-year history, George W. Bush's annually budgeted $7 billion federal monstrosity known as the TSA has served to steal in excess of $3 million of passengers' belongings. And as we head into another summer vacation season where last season the TSA failed to detect 95% of mock explosives or banned weapons, TSA whistleblowers testified on Capitol Hill today detailing detailing how the agency is coming apart at the seams. Department of Homeland Security Inspector General performed covert testing at TSA's airport's security sc screenings and found, quote, failures in technology, failures in TSA procedures, and human error, end quote. The TIG, the Inspector General, testified before this committee that, quote, layers of security were simply missing, end quote. Currently, the agency is losing. They're losing about 103 screeners each week through attrition. Now, that, that's a little bit of a scary number because I think that's telling us that they really don't like working there. In 2014, this is, again, a very stunning number, 373 people joined, but 4,644 people departed. What does that tell you? tells you there's probably a management problem there. Of the 320 agencies that are ranked and scored, the TSA ranked 313 out of 320, making it one of the worst places to work. As we've chatted with people and whistleblowers who's come forward, we found that the TSA has developed a highly retaliatory culture that discourages speaking up about problems. TSA remains in crisis as a result of poor leadership and oversight of many of our senior leadership appointments which have taken place over the past several years, some of which still serve in key positions within our agency today. Our culture went into rapid decline after having gone unchecked by its leader in various agencies and committees responsible for that oversight, and for that reason we continue to have a crisis of leadership and culture. For years, we had many senior executives, most of which who completely lacked the experience needed for their position, run amok and make decisions or conduct themselves in an unethical manner, which eroded our ability to complete the security mission and grossly compromise the integrity of our agency. Despite the results of our covert testing being made public, we still have some of those very same leaders in critical positions whose focus and attention are on numbers first and leave security and people last. These leaders are some of the biggest bullies in government and as a result, many people feel battered, abused, and overworked. These positional leaders convince themselves they are liked by everyone and their decisions are accepted because there's almost no one left to question them. The leadership imperative is missing at TSA. In your role as an oversight committee for TSA, you should be gravely alarmed and concerned with these issues because TSA employees are less likely to report operational security or threat relevant issues out of fear of retaliation. No one who reports issue at TSA is safe. This prevents the necessary organizational agility to respond to evolving threats and enemies who are always adapting to exploit any real potential or perceived opportunity to strike. This negates any operational improvement or process and prevents the AG from fulfilling its mandated mission of protecting the United States transportation system and protecting the economic well-being from threats. Um, a supervisor at the checkpoints had, had identified that he or she, it doesn't give his or her gender, had uh, expressed some frustrations that the wait times that they submit up forward was being changed by management. Uh, I can tell you at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, the airport police has at times begun to tabulate wait times. So think of that for a second. We, we are expending police forces, police resources at our airports to check on TSA reporting our wait times. And as recently as last month, uh, the airport is investing in some sort of automated uh, wait time um, calculations. That would indicate, sir, that uh, they don't trust the numbers that we're reporting. 
The TSA desperately attempted to shed a positive light on its efforts when it announced that it had broken a record during the week of April 15th through the 21st, claiming to have discovered 73 guns stashed in carry-on bags. But even if the report is valid, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the security America actually now requires. Thanks to President Obama, our borders are wide open for potential terrorism. Syrian refugees loaded with possible ISIS terrorists are quietly being flown into the United States. The American people have reached TSA burnout, as it has become abundantly clear that the TSA is a pointless agency, fleecing the American people of their rights, safety, taxes, belongings, and dignity. John Bound for Infowars.com. Yeah, they can pull any stunt. I mean, they can I crash just, economies to stop Trump. They've said that they'll never put up with it. These are arrogant kleptocrats. Yeah, what type of stunts haunt you in the middle of the night that they might pull, uh, Stone? Well, uh, look, I think they're capable of anything, including martial law. Uh, the, the establishment is petrified that the Trump wave is coming, and they see no way to stop it. I pray for him every night. I think it is very brave of him to continue to campaign in public. We can't even begin to imagine how many death threats he must be getting. So uh, I salute his courage uh, and his uh, bravery uh, to go out there and spearhead this movement for reform. Uh, at the same time, uh, you see, uh, you know, uh, shills like Mark Levin and Glenn Beck being paid millions of dollars. To, to continue to promote Ted Cruz. As their I mean, ratings I mean, plunge, as their ratings plunge, they are destroying themselves because their grassroots audience is saying no. Yeah, so, I mean, Mark Levin does the shady backroom book deal where he sells books at inflated prices to a Cruz patron, and they, they purchase his voice. Uh, it, it, in the old days, they would call this payola. I've written this for the Daily Caller. Uh, and Levin calls the Daily Caller an obscure website. No, it's a respected conservative website. So, um, some I mean, Tucker Carlson's a Fox said, pundit. Everybody knows the Daily Caller is amazingly respected. They, they're yeah, incredibly so, uh, accurate. It, this is part of the Cruz uh, obsession. I think the man lays awake at night worrying about what I'm going to do next. And you know what, Alex? He should. You should worry about that. Absolutely. So you lay awake at night thinking how sad you are for him that he lay awake at night. Adrian, great question. Uh, in closing, Mr. Show, we got more callers. I know you've got to go. Just thank you for all your hard work for this country and what you're doing. And, and obviously, this will become a big national issue. So please flush it out for a minute or two. You're saying they could do anything to try to stop Trump. I agree. They've said they'll do anything, including stealing elections, uh, canceling the popular vote. Hillary's doing it to Bernie Sanders. I see polls out where a third of them are saying they'll go with Trump. Uh, double the number of African Americans that went for Romney are saying they'll go and are going in primaries for Trump. Uh, Trump is the majority of Hispanic voters in primaries. And this is a this is a dream. It's it, it's populism that unites us all. We talk about martial law. Yeah, economic emergency, a new war, uh, some type of October surprise. Not that Obama's running, but running for the establishment. What type of false flags or October surprises in your you know deep brain? You know, they call the, the IBM computer deep blue and the deep stone, uh, you know, being inside all this, watching it, sitting at the foot of Richard Nixon. What would you be doing if you were them? Well, they could stage an international incident in which everybody has to rally around the president and then use that as a pretext to cancel the election. Uh, I also have, as you know, very deep concern about these computerized voter machines that are going to be in the key states like Michigan and Ohio and New York. In Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump and only Donald Trump is competitive. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of mountains to climb. But uh, as Nelson Rockefeller found out on the way, on his way to the presidency, you've got to get nominated for president first. I really think this is historic. Donald Trump is going to get 1,237 votes on the first ballot. There will be no second ballot. That is my bold prediction. I think that we understand the play here. The, the Clintonites are very concerned because Donald Trump has a very strong appeal to more than a third of the Bernie Sanders voters. These are blue-collar folks who have been left out by the New World Order economy. Uh, NAFTA and uh, presumably TPP and TPA, which Ted Cruz supports, uh, would uh, destroy our economy, are destroying their jobs and livelihoods. So those voters 
are susceptible to Trump. Therefore, we invade his rallies uh, and we brand him as a bigot and a racist and a misogynist in order to disqualify him from these voters who are probably slightly left of center. Uh, that's what they're afraid of. Now, Donald Trump is not going to get the hardcore leftists who are voting for Bernie. That's not what I'm saying. But his populist, uh, uh, blue-collar uh, Democrat supporters who realize uh, that these international trade deals are killing us. Well, that's it for our show. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.